So we have a team coming up, um, two different organi local organizations teamed up for this one. We have Laura Kelm. She is uh, with GreenVest, and she's an environmental scientist with a focus on water resource restoration and monitoring. Since 2011, she's worked for the in nonprofit and private sectors to monitor and improve water quality restore streams, and educate adults and youth on these and related topics. In her current position at GreenVest, Laura is involved in all phases of stream restoration projects, including site assessment, restoration design, construction oversight, post-construction monitoring, data analysis, technical writing, and landowner coordination, so quite a lot. And joining Laura, we have Jill Berg, uh, he is the practice leader for ecological restoration at Biohabitats. He is an ecosystems ecologist with a focus on restoration of integrated stream, wetland, and floodplain functions to deliver ecosystem services to society, increase natural capital, and integrate local community needs with an appreciation of natural resource values. So, Laura and Joe, welcome. So we're gonna be talking today about um, conversion of a base flow stream restoration system to a stage zero channel, thanks to some lovely beaver that moved into our restoration site. So just a little bit of background on the project. This is the Bacon Ridge Branch stream restoration, which occurred at the Elks Camp Barrett uh, facility in Crownsville, Annapolis area, Maryland. Um, it's in the Atlantic Coastal Plain in Anne Arundel County. Um, it was an MS4 stream restoration project. Um, land uses in the area include uh, mostly forested, some impervious cover, some low density residential development, some agriculture. Um, historically, there was a lot of ag in the area. Um, the camp itself, the Elks Camp Barrett, is pretty much undeveloped for over 100 years. So beautiful forested area. They have um, an upland area that has you know a parking lot, handful of buildings, cabins, things like that. But majority of the property is beautiful floodplain forest. So there's a lot of channel degradation. The channels were quite in size. We'll show you some photographs from pre-construction. Um, a lot of that was due to um, increased runoff from development impervious surfaces in the area, um, as well as a history of deforestation um, from, from the ag in the area, soil loss, and just general not great livestock management practices. So the stream project uh, totaled around 18,000 18, linear feet, so quite sizable. Um, that includes perennial, intermittent, and ephemeral channels. Um, the main channels were not centered in the floodplain. Often they were hugging one of the valley walls, um, and likely it was realigned at some point. Um, and rather than moving the entire channel back into the center of the floodplain, um, we focused on changing um, changing the channel profile and not the plan form. We wanted to be um, least impactful to this um, forested floodplain, so we didn't want to move the whole channel and do a traditional natural channel design. Um, instead, we wanted to have more of a lighter touch on the ecosystem. So we used uh, 61 log jams, which are uh, beaver dam analog structures throughout these two main perennial channels and um, put a lot of large woody debris within the floodplain, including in log sill structures and then also just in general floodplain roughness. So um, what Scott was referring to as, you know, a bit of a messy restoration structures. Sure, I'll, I'll talk about this because this is what's always in, in change from, from project to project. Um, each, each, uh, engineered log structure that we build, um, after it gets constructed, we, we tend to go back and, and think about those again and make modifications to improve them. But um, basically, uh, we're, we're taking this incised channel, uh, building an earthen plug in the channel, and then inserting wood into that earthen plug, um, starting with root wads where the trees say eight to 16 inch diameter trees have been pulled out of the ground with an excavator roots intact then cut off maybe eight foot above uh, ground level inverted and pushed back into the channel and it might take three to five to ten of those um, root wads depending on the 
the width of the channel. Uh, this particular project at Elks Camp, um, the streams uh, were often 30 foot wide, the incised width, and then um, five to 10 foot incised um, depth. So, so the, the root rods installed in this earthen plug would be the new channel invert, which would be within six inches, most often within six inches of the top of bank. In some cases, a little bit higher, in some cases, a little bit lower, depending on the elevation of the adjacent floodplain. You wouldn't want to set these things too high and backwater three acres of forest at wetland and, and kill all the trees. I mean, perhaps um, you would if that was your design intent, but our, our design intent was to protect the existing forest resource, reconnect the, the channel. And as you saw in the earlier slide, this was a fairly large drainage area, about 6,000 acre drainage area. So we, we had plenty of water coming down to rehydrate the wetland with almost every precipitation event. So in addition to those root rods, we would take the, the tree trunks, which was um, commonly the most, uh, the material in greatest surplus. So we would, we would cross them above and below these root wide structures to create a concentrated flow path in that, um, that crossing V, if you will, in terms of the, you know, looking at it in profile. Um, and, um, then just smash all the treetops on the front edge and the downstream edge of this um, engineered wood structure. And what that did was that allowed all that sort of think about it as a wood riffle. So even though the, the root wads and the log crossing structures may only have had a, had a, a width as the channel flows or a length as the channel flows of 10 or 12 feet, the entire a uh, riffle area might be 30 foot as the water sees it as it's running down. And that, that helps to uh, minimize the risk of, of a, a break in the water surface elevation, which would scour and erode material. Um, it also creates a reduced risk of the site, the uh, structure blowing out. Um, I could go on and talk a lot longer, but I'm probably eating into some other material, so I'll just I, go on I, to the next. I, I think one of the other um, important things to note about the detail that we showed in the last slide is that this structure has been used or proposed in projects since then, and it seems like every time it's a little bit different, so we keep learning from how the structures are installed and how they function and how they're doing. So it's definitely an evolving design. So we're trying to mimic what beavers are doing, but you know, we're, we're not beavers. So we have right. to keep, keep working at it. So, so far we have like say three, three projects that have already been constructed and, and that would total about 200 of these engineered wood structures on three different projects. And we learn with each one and we modify them based on what we're seeing at other sites. Um, this is a, a pre and post of Elks Camp. And you can see in the, the pre, this is me walking down in the woods during a light rain. That's the, the channel invert. It's about six foot um, below the floodplain elevation. And this is the same area, the same trees. Um, after restoration, and you can see we're sort of up to the top with the uh, base flow channel, um, which gives you rehydration of the, the wetland hydrology, uh, reconnection to the floodplain with pretty much every precipitation event. Um, really a lot of benefits that accrue from that. Um, another before and after um, couple of photos. Again, me in the creek, and you can see that water is not even over the top of my boots. So if you think about it from a fish fisheries perspective, and this is a, historically was a yellow perch spawning run. Yellow perch, you know, they're, they're about this tall from their belly to their back, and there's only about an inch of water in the channel at base flow condition versus... Um, in the restored condition, we have, you know, five to six foot of water in these pools. And, and this coarse um, 
wood associated with these riffle grade control structures is exactly what they like to spawn on. Uh, they, you know, they spawn out this rope of their eggs, which gets snagged on wood. And then um, the, as the water flows through it, the eggs mature and hatch. Um, I guess I'll just make the point about um, the functional uplift. I mean, without having tons of background information on, on how things have changed out here, it's really common sense. If you're going from a U-shaped cross section like this with an inch of water in the bottom to something like this with all of this complex structure, you know you, you've got a lot more aquatic habitat. So lots of functional uplift. I'll go back to you. <laughs> Just a few more um, pre-construction photos. So, oh. yeah, so you can see that the top of bank is basically about head height in some places. In some places, it literally was eight foot in size. Um, other places, it was only about three to four foot. So it wasn't this bad everywhere, but across the site, it was not good. So again, the arrow is pointing towards the same tree in both of these photos. So you can really see the difference pre to, to post-construction. Then some nice post-construction photos shown in different locations throughout this site. So we're getting floodplain connection with multiple storm events a year. So I looked at um, a hydrograph that we have for um, an in-stream logger. And uh, for last year, I think we had about a dozen out-of-bank flow events in one part of the site. Um, nice benefit of all of that floodplain reconnection is that we historically had a lot of wetlands probably in the floodplain. Um, there's some evidence of that. And they've now been rehydrated. And there's wetlands throughout the site where they hadn't previously been delineated. So we're getting really great uplift throughout the site, not just in the stream channels themselves. And um, surprise, surprise, we've had some beaver come into the site. Um, so we've seen some evidence really throughout the site. We've seen uh, chewed stumps at various locations around the, the, around the site. Um, we had this small little beaver dam last summer that formed, but nothing really materialized from it. It was gone in a few months and hasn't come back. This is the most consistent beaver dam that we've seen on site. It's at the upstream end of one of the one of the streams in the project area, and that's really been a presence on site for the last two years or so. Um, and it just continues to uh, to grow and get bigger and bigger, which is pretty awesome, but also causes some headaches for me from a maintenance perspective. Um, but I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so the you know the idea of the zero stage. So the the. The beaver dam that was in the previous slide is um, about three foot higher than the wood riffle gray control structure that it was built upon. And, and this is, is a side dam that's hundreds of feet long that, um, you know, they, they didn't want to, or they couldn't build the dam any higher. So instead what they did was they ran around the the edge of the dam and then up the stream valley to be able to store more water because their their area of interest was not necessarily um, this part of the floodplain where where we're all standing but up in this area which is is this you know going up in this direction so so they're they're building this dam to impound up the side uh, drain um so so the, those last two photos were downstream of a road, and these photos were taken upstream of the road. So you can see the culvert in the left-hand photo on the left-hand side. Yeah, right there. So then the next two photos are taken standing on the road and looking upstream out of the project area, but obviously the um, backwater extent is way up in that area. Thank you for that. Very, <laughs> very helpful. Yeah. Um, and just... Um, the probable lodge here. So it's it's interesting that, you know, they're manipulating, um, and this is also true at the upstream most part of the main step, the, the effect of the beaver as well as the stream restoration propagates for thousands of feet upstream and downstream of our actual restored reach. Um, so just, you know, hitting on that um, idea of the zero stage, 
channel that that you know we've all heard a lot about. Um, you know, when we were doing the design, uh, it, because we didn't want to change the plan form to the center of the floodplain, the center of the stream valley, um, we were really careful about um, putting a lot of wood structures and um, those kind of rough elements, because actually the the, the part of the stream valley where the stream was, was not the lowest part of the stream valley. There was actually the opposite valley wall had a flow path that was a little bit lower. So we had to roughen that one up. And what we have happening now with the that lateral um, addition to the beaver dam is, is the water is moving across the floodplain to that low area but it's not pushing all of the stream flow. It's only, it's sort of proportioning between the inflow and, and this tributary has about a 650 acre drainage area. So it's, it's a, a modest size channel, um, but it's pushing the water between our designed flow path and the, um, the other side of the, the floodplain, which is giving us this really incredible, um, matrix of multiple channel flows with wetlands in between with with surviving trees trees that haven't been drowned out in between so a very complex flow path and as um as scott had said earlier multiple aquatic habitats um just another image and you're getting to see some of the the flow path some of the beaver work here basically the the dam is in the room in front of us and this is the flow path that we're we're talking about pushing the water out onto the opposite valley wall as opposed to um, this flow path which is running downstream from the it, in, in addition to the beaver making that um, zero stage feature or as close as we we can imagine um, to a zero stage feature the the channel was built to have regular communication with the floodplain. And even at base flow, um, our stream is shedding some of its water out into the floodplain. So it's the stream is putting water out into lower depressional features of the floodplain. It's running downstream valley and then finding its way back into the channel at multiple points. So it's not, it's not truly a zero stage system, but it is a multi-thread channel along the profile as you go from upstream to downstream, um, which is introducing an incredible amount of habitat. Um, in addition to um, supporting vernal pools and all the amphibians associated with those, um, we've got areas of marsh, areas of marsh developing. Um, so for instance, in, a, in the forested floodplain, um, in the, the pre-restoration condition, the Elks Camp had removed some trees and um, weed whipped areas for public gatherings down in the floodplain. So um, parts of the floodplain didn't have a real strong forest character. And now they're, um, they have a, a preponderance of um, broadleaf emergence and um, carracks and sedges and wool grass that have uh, volunteered and are really, um, really attractive. I took uh, University of Maryland's uh, wetland class out to the site, about 35 students and the professor, and um, they were just thrilled with with the diversity and the um, intensity of the, the different kinds of wetland habitat out there. So, so, you know, when we talk about the uplift associated with the aquatic resource, which is what we're most often doing when we're thinking about streams, um, you can't downplay the uplift associated with the restoration of wetland hydrology and maybe even the um, enhancement um, by creating a wetland hydrology that is perhaps more intense than what was out there before and the diversity that that generates. 
Want to talk about beaver challenges? Sure. And this and what the maintenance. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So as I as I mentioned, the the beaver moving in has given me um, a little bit of a headache, um, just in terms of maintenance and monitoring and what's okay and what's not okay. Um, so Beaver Dam, um, as Joe mentioned, is probably built up about three foot on top of an upstream log dam. So diverting all that water into the right floodplain has reduced the volume of water that's in the mainstream channel. So we now have a few dry log jams downstream from that when we're not in storm conditions. Is that okay? Is it not okay? I don't know. It seems to be we're, we're talking to everybody, getting different opinions on things, but it's not something that we had talked about ahead of time about what if there's no flow over these structures. So um, it's sort of a, a big conversation that we're having um, amongst ourselves, but also with um, the regulators for the project. Um, and just, just to raise a, a funny little point. So um, it's temporally variable as well. So, so I was, I went out and I looked and I saw there was less water in some of the the pools and going over the riffles downstream from the beaver dam. And I went back to Laura and said, I think we need to put in a beaver deceiver to increase the amount of flow that's going downstream, not to protect the floodplain um, that is getting this surplus flow, but to protect the structures and the flow path that we've built. And, and so we had this conversation and Laura wasn't convinced. We went out there the next time the basis for my suggestion of the beaver receiver was gone. These pools were now full to the top and water was flowing over the riffle grade controls. And it's not like we had big storms or an excessively uh, dry period for my observation. So there's just, um, you know, a lot of temporal and spatial variation. And, and that's not something that we all often factor into our decision um, patterns. Yeah, so a flow device is something that we're still sort of back and forth on. We take some people out to the site and they say, no, you definitely need something. And then we take other people out there and they say, it's great the way it is, just let it, let it be. Um, so we're, we're still, uh, we're back and forth on that. Um, that small side channel that Joe had mentioned um, by the right valley wall is getting a lot more flow. Um, is that okay? Is it not okay? Again, something that we're, we're keeping an eye on. Um, and then what are the regulatory implications for all of this? You know, this isn't exactly in line with the project monitoring requirements and success criteria, but it's not really counter to those things that's sort of in line with it. So um, we're just having a lot of conversations about is the current state of the project um, with, with the beaver, is this okay with everybody? Is it not okay? What are the um, potential issues that we're gonna run into? What are some management things that we might need to be doing um, to make sure that everybody's happy and the project is continuing to function and also provide the ecological uplift that it has been providing. So just um, real quick, some of the um, adaptive management things that we've completed um, or that we're in process of completing. So we've got all that um, flow going into the right floodplain from the, the spillover from the ponding. So we've added a lot of live stakes to that area to try and provide some rooting mass and additional surface roughness. Um, we've, we're, we're in the process of modeling the water surface elevation to determine if that's okay or not okay, or if we do need to install a flow device. Um, and then we've just continued to add a lot of brush into the floodplain, basically, to just add more roughness and um, hopefully make sure that everything stays nice and stable and we don't get any new incised channels forming. So over the last two years, it's been looking really good and we're just uh, continuing to keep an eye on it. And um, I think we're out of time. <laughs> much.